probably be killed or, at the very least, arrested for writing this. I don't care anymore, I just want to get the truth out. Quinny, I'm sorry. It was just after 8 in the morning when we pulled up to the dive bar on the corner. The bar opened early, catering to the third shift South Philly stevedores over at the docks. Quinn sat in the passenger seat, his black leather coat straining to conceal his considerable bulk. He trained his predatory gaze on the bar's front door from under the brim of his gray Jeff cap. What's the kid's name again? He asked. Sal Narducci, I said. Quinn should have known Sal's name already, but the finer details of our operations at the docks always bored him. Among our port guys, Sal was younger than most, but I was glad we made him the overnight shop steward. He proved to be a solid kid, which was why we immediately came out here when he told us he had some concerns. Sal walked out of the bar, breath frosting in the cruel, February wind. I waved him over, he got into the car, I reached back and shook his hand. What's up buddy? He nodded to me, hey Frank, he said. Hey Quinn. Quinn grumbled a hello as he lit a Marlboro. Sal rubbed his frigid hands together and spoke through chattering teeth. How's your uncle? It's been a while since I last seen him. He's doing good, I said, although that was a lie. Uncle Mick's health had gone to shit in the past year. He rarely left the house, which meant I handled the day-to-day -day operations at the docks. So we heard you had some issues during your shift last night. I said. I watched him in the rearview mirror, fingers trembling as he struggled to light a cigarette. You guys know I never make a peep, Sal said. Your uncle knows that I keep my head down and do my job. That's why we're here, bud, I said. When a guy like you has a concern, we listen. Our uncle listens. Yeah, so spit it the fuck out already, Quinn said. We had a ship come in around 3 in the morning, Sal said. There was a shipment on there, for the Russians, I think. He slipped me a piece of paper with the box's serial number written on it. What was the problem? I asked as I pocketed the number. The box had an air vent, Frank. They all do, Quinn barked back. Small vents, yeah, Sal said. This vent was bigger, I asked. Sal nodded, his eyes darting this way and that, like he was afraid we were being watched. Someone rigged it up that way. The manufacturers don't make them that big. He paused and took a long drag from his cigarette. This vent was big enough so someone inside the box could breathe. I lit a smoke of my own. It's not what you think. But even as I said that, I shot a sideways glance at Quinn and saw my big cousin's face turn pale. Our uncle doesn't deal in that kind of business, I assured Sal, and, to a degree, Quinn. Sal wasn't convinced. Couldn't the Russians just lie to you guys and say it was something else? It's probably an animal, I said, giving Sal a reassuring smile. An animal? Quinn asked. Yeah, I said. Russians like exotic pets. Check it out on YouTube. I looked back at Sal. Poor kid wasn't even 35 yet, but right now he looked like he was pushing 50. Listen guys, I know it's against the rules, but if we could just go crack that box open, I'd feel a whole lot better, Sal said. We never opened shipments. The contents were in our business. We were middlemen, that was all. Various factions around Philly paid us a fee to ferry their wares through the docks with little fanfare. If we started poking our noses where they didn't belong, it could cost us money. Sal Narducci, the stevedore with a conscience. I wondered, if I told him no, we weren't going to crack open that sea box, would he go ahead and do it anyway, on his own? I sighed, then glanced over to Quinn, the way that I did whenever we were in these situations. Quinn cocked an eyebrow, as if to say, are you sure? I nodded back to him, quick and subtle. All right, I said. We'll head over there with you right now and get to the bottom of this. Sal smiled at that, tears of relief welling up in his eyes. Thanks guys, thank you so fucking much. The shocks groaned as Quinn rolled out of the passenger seat. Here, switch places with me, Quinn said to Sal. Easier for you to give directions once we're at the docks. Sal nodded, got out, and took the passenger seat. 
Quinn slumped in behind Sal, making the car rock uneasily like a ship listing from side to side. You're a solid guy, I told Sal as I pulled onto Washington Ave. In the back seat, Quinn discreetly doused a rag with chloroform then clamped it tight around Sal's mouth. Sal bucked and kicked like an animal caught in a snare, but Quinn held him firm. Within seconds, Sal slumped in his seat, unconscious. Quinn donned two white latex gloves and pulled out a small pill bottle from his coat. Inside were a half dozen counterfeit Percocets. Each one contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. As I turned onto I-95 North, Quinn pulled open Sal's slackened jaw then pushed the pill down his throat. We were looping through the claustrophobic West Kensington side streets as we waited for Sal to stop breathing. The kid's eyelids fluttered, flashing his milky, bloodshot eyes like scoops of vanilla ice cream topped with raspberry syrup. Quinn reached up from the back seat and pressed his fingers against Sal's carotid artery. He checked Sal's pulse against his wristwatch as the seconds ticked away. Shouldn't be too much longer, Quinn said. He leaned back into his seat, making the springs shriek beneath him. So what do you think? About what? I said. About the sea box with the big air vent. Probably an animal, I said. Or something organic that needs a certain amount of oxygen. Like what? Quinn asked. I don't know, I said. Fucking plants or some shit. Yeah, I guess, maybe. Sal's chest heaved. I noticed a ring of vomit around his mouth. His breaths, already labored, were now accompanied by a gurgling, liquid sound. I rolled to a stop by an alley between two derelict houses. Up the alley, I spotted the rats, dark shapes scrabbling in the shadows. Next to me, Sal let out one final gurgling respiration before his body went still. We dumped Sal Narducci's body in the alley, one more overdose in a neighborhood full of them. As we got back into the car, my beeper went off, a signal from Uncle Mick. I looked at the message, a single digit, the number 9. Quinn must have known from my expression, Claremont again. I nodded as we pulled away, Claremont again. Uncle Mick lived in a two-story row home in Fishtown. He'd always lived alone, except for when he took in me and Quinn. Our parents checked out together in a car wreck back in 98. On the couch, he looked like a grizzly sitting upright, beer in hand, a Marlboro tucked into the corner of his mouth. He exhaled cigarette smoke through nostrils the color of a ripe plum. Uncle Mick hacked phlegm into a fist the size of a misshapen softball. How'd it go with the kid? Quinn lowered his head and made for the kitchen. Not well, I told my uncle. He found a sea box with an air vent. Uncle Mick fired back a slug from his Budweiser, golden restorative sloshing in the bottle. They all have air vents. He said it was a big air vent. And... We'll need a new overnight shop steward. Out in the kitchen, we heard ice clinking into glasses, then the whine of the liquor cabinet hinges as Quinn searched for the Bushmills. Uncle Mick leaned forward and lowered his voice. Was the kid right to be worried? He was worried over nothing, I answered. He narrowed his bloodshot gaze as if he were studying me. Them young Chinese girls in the wishy-washies don't grow on trees, Frankie, he said quietly. I don't want no part of that. I made sure to look him squarely in the eye. We don't have any part of that, Uncle Mick. Quinn returned with three tumblers, whiskey on the rocks. He passed one to me and another to Uncle Mick. Quinn slumped his shoulders as he stared into his glass, clinking ice cubes bubbling in the amber contents. Uncle Mick squeezed Quinn's hand. You're a soldier, Quinny, just like me, Quinn forced a grin. Thanks, Uncle Mick. Uncle Mick raised his glass. Slante, he said. Slante, we repeated. We all took a drink. Uncle Mick downed his tumbler in one gulp then rested the glass on his rounded belly. Reggie wants to meet tomorrow. King of Prussia Mall, 2 o'clock sharp. He give any details? Quinn asked, though Reggie Claremont rarely did. Nah, Uncle Mick said. He looked away from us then, his eyes dripping melancholy. And hey, tomorrow, you two go on your own. Quinn looked at me concerned. I shrugged. Just us? I asked. Uncle Mick hacked mucus into his fist, then glanced over to the set of portable oxygen tanks he was supposed to use, but hardly ever did. It's been a while since the last time we saw him, and I don't want him to see me like, you know. I threw back the rest of my whiskey and patted the old bear on his shoulder. Don't sweat it, Uncle Mick. 
Me and Quinny got you covered. Claremont and Uncle Mick had been SEALs during the Cold War. They met in Nicaragua, Uncle Mick told us, where they trained Contras and ran Black Ops against the Sandinistas. We became real good buddies, me and Reggie, Uncle Mick had said once. But we went our separate ways after our deployment was over. Saying they went on deviating paths would be a bit of an understatement. While Uncle Mick was busy taking over the Riverwards, Claremont became a dedicated federale. They didn't speak for a long time, not until about 10 years ago, when Claremont reached out to Uncle Mick for a favor. Claremont headed a subdivision of the FBI that few people knew about. It didn't even have a name. This subdivision investigated odd cases, as Claremont put it. Cases that, I assumed, the intelligence brass would prefer keeping tucked away in an iron vault in the bowels of 935 Pennsylvania Avenue. Claremont had been in the market for subcontractors to carry out off-the-books operations. I need guys who are dependable, who can work independently, and most importantly, will keep a very level head in strange situations, he'd told Uncle Mick. In return, Claremont offered to pull some strings that would ensure Uncle Mick got control of the Philly Longshoremen's Union, which would effectively crown him King of the Docks. Claremont's jobs, although heavy on legwork, were usually straight up hits with a strange caveat thrown in. He once sent us to track down some voodoo shaman who lived in a Louisiana swamp. All we had to do was slit his throat with a crucifix, shaved down to a dagger. Fucker didn't even fight back, just sat there whispering a prayer in Creole while the blood fanned out. As his face dried and cracked, mottled skin vacuum sealed to his skull as his eyes leaked out of his sockets, yolk spilling from a cracked egg. Last year, he dispatched us to this frozen armpit of a town two hours outside Denver to take care of an elderly antique dealer. The job was straightforward enough until Quinn popped the guy twice in the noggin. Instead of a familiar pink mist, boiling black pus leaked from the cavern in the guy's head and sizzled right through the floorboards. Easy peasy, sure, but sometimes Quinn got weird afterward. That wasn't to say my big cousin didn't perform as admirably as always, but now and again, he'd get real quiet after a Claremont job. Frank, you ever think about what comes next, after we die? He'd ask me after we finished a job down in Florida. I didn't and, up until then, neither had Quinn. He'd been a stalwart non-believer despite our Catholic upbringing. As for me, I gave up the pretense of belief during high school, shortly after a priest cornered me in a bathroom and tried to give me a blowjob. Some of this shit we do for Claremont makes me think about it, Quinn said, about what comes after. I only think about the job, Quinny, I answered. We parked in the King of Prussia Mall parking garage third floor, just out of view from the security cameras. Per Claremont's instructions, Reginald Claremont was six and a half feet of muscle carved from volcanic rock. Hulking as he was, his cold baritone voice, detached demeanor, and thick glasses gave him the air of a warrior intellectual. In the decade that I'd known him, he hadn't aged a day. However, as he slipped into the back seat, I saw that he had dark bags under his eyes, as if he hadn't been sleeping. He sank into the seat like he had weights on his ankles. This concerned me. Claremont had been peeling the back layers of reality to peer at the dark things wiggling beneath for years, with nothing less than cold objectivity. Perhaps the job was starting to get to him. Or maybe it was just this current assignment that had him rattled. Where's your uncle? He asked, his voice tinged with disappointment. He hasn't been feeling well, I said. Claremont smiled sadly. Cigarettes? I nodded. I told him those Marlboros would do him in, Claremont said. Myself, I kicked the habit after our last deployment. I heard somewhere that only a third of smokers die of a smoking-related illness, Quinn said as he lit one up. Still ain't good odds, though. No, I guess not, Claremont said. He paused contemplatively, watching the smoke from Quinn's cigarette curl and dance. Actually, let me bum one of those. Quinn gave him one. Claremont lit up, relishing the smoke, a nicotine catharsis. So, what do you got for us? I asked. This assignment might be a tad bit hairier than usual, Claremont said. The good news is that it's close. Yeah, I said. Only two hours up the PA turnpike, Claremont answered. Up in coal country, in the woods. It's isolated too, so you won't have to deal with any prying eyes. Who's the target? I asked. 
There will be three soft targets, Claremont began, but we're mainly concerned with an extraction. His name is Colton Shelby, a Catholic priest with a background in engineering. I hadn't anticipated that we'd be taking anyone alive. Claremont's jobs were always of the pop em and drop em variety. He never asked us to nab anyone before. By Quinn's expression, I could tell he had the same reservations. Is he dangerous? I asked. On a normal day, no, Claremont explained. But within the next 48 hours, Shelby is going to run an experiment on himself inside a cabin he's constructed out in the woods. When you get to him, he may be in a strange state. I can wrangle a motherfucker no problem, Quinn said. But can we get a bit more to go on than that? Unfortunately not, because I genuinely don't know, Claremont said. Shelby studied sacred geometry at the Vatican. He found a text that some long ago pontiff deemed off limits. Long story short, Shelby thinks he figured out God's name. What, fucking Yahweh or whatever, Quinn asked. No, Claremont said. Some have speculated that God's true name can only be conveyed through certain geometric patterns. Shelby believes that if he spells God's name backwards, he'll gain access to heaven. Claremont never gave background info on a target, unless it was concrete. I pictured Claremont watching through reinforced tempered glass as men in white coats constructed those very same geometric patterns in the labyrinthine depths of some government black site. Ice filled my bowels, pray tell, my good agent Claremont. What happened to those unlucky schmucks when they fucked around with the Almighty's birth name? But I couldn't let my imagination get to me. I lit a smoke, inhaled long and deep, and reminded myself that this was what we had to deal with to keep the docks. Claremont passed us a surveillance photo of Shelby. He certainly looked the part. Pensive eyes beaming with intensity, sunken cheeks, and a long, graying Rasputin beard that completed the mad acolyte aesthetic. You won't be going in blind, Claremont said. Shelby's three male followers are all true believers, but there'll be a fourth, a female. She's one of my sources. An agent? I asked. Claremont shook his head. No. So, another subcontractor, just like us. Her name's Kendra, Claremont said. She's Shelby's newest recruit. He gave us the girl's picture. She was pretty, but young, with dark hair and a mouse-like face. Something about her seemed familiar. It was her eyes, I realized. They had the same haunted quality that Quinn got after one of Claremont's jobs. Quinn snatched the girl's picture, looked her over, then glared back at Claremont. This gave me a jump. I looked down to Quinn's waist to make sure he wasn't reaching for his 38. How old is the girl? Quinn asked. Claremont cleared his throat. He stared right back into Quinn's fiery gaze, eye to eye, with neither yielding an inch. Twenty years old, Claremont finally said. Quinn narrowed his eyes. How'd your outfit rope a girl that young into a job like this? That's not pertinent information, Claremont said. Yeah, it doesn't matter, Quinny, I said. Quinn didn't break eye contact with Claremont. I can understand you using guys like us, Quinn said. But a girl that barely looks a day out of high school. Claremont sat up a little straighter. I noted that he was slowly curling his hands into fists. So how's the port business, boys? Claremont said, though his steely gaze betrayed his casual tone. I was reading in the news that one of the shop stewards overdosed. A young guy with no history of drug abuse, if I'm not mistaken. I squeezed Quinn's shoulder. It's been rough, I told Claremont. We're getting through it, though. Finally, Quinn turned away from Claremont. I exhaled, lungs burning. I hadn't realized I'd been holding my breath. Claremont opened a folder and passed it to me. Here's a map of the area. Get there early and take this exact position overlooking the cabin. He tapped his finger on a large red X on the map. It looked to be around 100 yards from the cabin. When should we make our grand entrance? I asked. You'll see a bright light inside the cabin, he said. I mean bright. That's why it's important you keep your distance. I thought about those unlucky guys in the white coats again. When the light fades, wait a full minute before approaching the cabin, Claremont said. When you're inside, things will be strange. I laughed, though I didn't think anything was funny. This won't be the first haunted house you sent us to. This will be different, he said. You may be disoriented initially, but just stay calm. Shelby will be in the middle of the room. There, things will appear closer to normal. Quinn looked back over his shoulder, locking eyes with Claremont once again. And how do you know that? 
Claremont took a long drag from his cigarette then shook his head without saying a word. I guess that ain't pertinent either, Quinn said. Claremont passed me a burner phone. There's one number programmed onto this phone, Claremont said. When you have Shelby, dial that number and the cavalry will arrive. I took the phone and nodded to him. Sounds simple enough. Claremont opened the door and got out. Tell your uncle, I said hello, he said. In the side mirror, I watched him walk off, cigarette smoke trailing behind him. Guided by Claremont's map, we ditched our car along the eastern slopes and began our long, miserable walk into the grim coal country hills. The temperature crept above the freezing mark and a light rain thawed the soil, turning it into a brown soup. Quinn was quieter than usual, hardly saying a word since we departed from Philly. Though he didn't say it, I could tell he was still hung up on Claremont's girl, Kendra. It was almost dark by the time we found the cabin in a small clearing nestled in among the barren trees. Me and Quinn took position on the western hillside, roughly a football field away, hidden by skeletal tree branches and gnarled bramble. Looking through my binoculars, I saw that the cabin was definitely a rush job just plywood and drywall from the look of it. Although it did look sturdy, there was a mud splattered pickup truck with a trailer hooked on the tow hitch. I figured that was how Shelby's merry little band got their building materials out here. Though we spotted no movement outside, Shelby and his gang were still hard at work inside the cabin. We could hear the persistently banging hammers and the occasional snarl from a circular saw. I'm dying for a cigarette. Quinn grumbled. Yeah, me too, I said. We couldn't light up out here since it would risk giving away our position. We'd have to make do with nicotine gum. I passed a piece to Quinn. How are you holding up? I asked. He chewed the gum thoughtfully. I think I might need some time off, Frankie, he said. Good, very good. I preferred that Quinn recognized that the work was getting to him, rather than being in denial about it. Yeah, buddy, I said. When we get back, take off all the time that you need. He nodded. A few weeks would do me good. Down in the cabin, the hammers fell silent. I pulled out my stopwatch, thumb on the switch, staring at the cabin, waiting. A moment later, we heard the girls scream, piercing and terrible, cleaving through the silence like a machete through a limb. Quinn shot up, clenching his 38. The girl, I grabbed for him, tried to pull him back, but he took off down the darkened hill, running toward the cabin. Quinn, wait. I hissed at him, but it did no good. That was when the flash came, painfully brilliant. A blinding golden glare that shone through the cracks within the cabin's structure before it illuminated the entire hillside, searing my eyes. My field of vision burned with white fire, a thermonuclear snapshot. It only lasted a moment before it flickered down to a dull glow within the cabin. My vision began to clear. Quinn had made it halfway toward the cabin before the flash knocked him on his ass. He struggled to his feet and began staggering the rest of the way. God damn it. I said to myself, then hit the stopwatch and waited, one eternal second at a time, as Quinn threw open the cabin door and barreled inside. The stopwatch hit the 60 second mark and I took off, racing through the thawed muck, toward the dying golden light shining through the cabin's cracks. I reached for the door, raised my 38 revolver, and stepped inside. I stumbled forward, into a disjointed panorama of the universe. The world became a shattered rainbow mirror, with each broken shard reflecting reflecting a different aspect of space-time. I floated in the amniotic waters within my mother's womb, then squinted, and saw my cells divide, then multiply, then wither and die. I marveled at the untold histories etched onto my being, then followed my lineage back to a trilobite drifting in the primordial stew. Behind me, the very nature of reality shook and sundered as the singularity gave birth to the cosmos. Ahead of me, I watched as the last stars winked out casting eternal darkness upon a cold, barren universe. In one ear, I listened to a Cherokee warrior's final death rattle, his body riddled with musket balls. In the other, I heard an entire civilization's collective scream moments before the firmament split and the sky blazed with celestial hellfire. I huddled with a dozen young women crammed behind a false wall inside a sea box, sweltering, breathing in the toxic stench from the tin buckets overflowing with urine and shit. 
I felt the malignant lumps growing in my uncle's chest, unthinking yet ravenously hungry, spreading their greedy tendrils throughout his lungs. I glimpsed heaven on the day of creation as God first revealed himself. Angels dropped to their knees in terror as his dreadful shadow fell upon the kingdom as I tried to comprehend his unknowable shape. My primitive brain shrank into itself, a turtle retreating into its shell. Yet as my mind retreated, a single thought trickled out, like the last drop of water dripping from a rusted sewer pipe. Quinny, I need to get to Quinny. Yes, then I remembered. I shut my eyes and felt the wooden floorboards beneath my boots. I took one step forward, then another. The cosmic violence screaming around me faded slowly with each step, until at last I heard the sound of creaking lumber and caught the aroma of burned meat. It was like stepping into the eye of a hurricane. The prismatic chaos shimmered around us, undulating around a cylindrical shaft of blood-red light. On the floor lay four charred cadavers, all but unrecognizable, although only their flesh had been burned. Oddly, their clothes hadn't been affected. Quinn stood over the corpses, but his attention was trained on the awful, writhing mass of pale flesh chained upon a crude stone altar in the center of the floor. Quinny, I said. My cousin turned to me. His face was blackened and cracked. His left eyelid was mostly missing and the flesh had been burned off his right hand, all the way down to the bone. It's her, Frank. Quinn said. He nodded to the altar. Looking down at those burnt cadavers, I noticed that one of them wore a black cassock with a white collar. Apparently, when the moment of truth came, Colt and Shelby had gotten cold feet about touching divinity. I stepped up next to Quinn and beheld the monstrosity, chains clinking as the girl tugged at her bonds. She moaned, softly and anguished. She opened her ruined maw to speak but only distant rasps came out. Kendra's eyes lolled about listlessly and, when she looked at me, her ragged maw curved into a frown as tears trickled down her cheeks. Quinn cocked the hammer of his 38. We can't leave her like this, he said. We're not, I told him. Claremont will help her. Claremont, Quinn said. His voice wheezed as he spoke, as if his airway had been charred along with the rest of him. Claremont won't help her. He'll put her in a box so they can cut her open and see what makes her tick. Quinny, listen to me, I said. You need to remember why we're here. Remember Uncle Mick. Remember the docks. Quinn smiled, his charred lips cracking and oozing puss. I do remember, he said. That's why I'm not letting anyone put another girl in a box. Quinn raised his revolver and aimed at the girl. I'll take care of you, honey, he said. And he would have if I hadn't pulled the trigger first. My big cousin fell to the floor, still twitching, and I put two more in him just to make sure he didn't suffer. Then the prism faded and the shaft of red light along with it. I made the call to Claremont's people then sat there in the dark, listening to Kendra's hopeless whimpers. Within 15 minutes, soldiers in black masks arrived. They shackled the girl to a stretcher then spirited her out into the night. By the time I got to the docks, a light snow was peppering the city and the icy wind bit right down into my bones. Even at 3 in the morning the docks were alive with forklifts belching propane fumes, roaring diesel big rigs, and the cranes chugging hydraulics out beyond the stacks. I was more than a little drunk, and the overnight foreman was more than a little nervous when I demanded. He'd take me up into the warehouse's shipping and receiving office. I didn't blame him. The rank and file were all still whispering about Sal Narducci, no doubt. The office was perched high above the stacks. The nervous foreman was at the computer looking up the location of the sea box Sal had told me about. As the foreman worked, I leaned against the window, gazing out over the docks. I threw back another slug of whiskey. Once I had the box loaded onto a truck, I'd drop it off beneath the I-95 overpass down in Fishtown. Then I'd free the cargo and be fucking done with it. Behind me, the foreman looked up from over the monitor, sweat beating across his hairline. Uh, there's a problem, he said. What? I asked. He swallowed hard, his voice shook. That box got sent out this afternoon, he said. If you want, I can pull up the destination. Don't bother, I said. By now, the cargo was likely dispersed among the countless massage parlors and speakeasy brothels around the city. I took another long drink and shut my eyes, but I couldn't shake the image of the disfigured girl shackled to that stretcher. I wondered where Claremont had her now, if they'd descended upon her with scalpels and pincers yet. 
I drove my fist into the window glass, shattering it along with my knuckles. The broken shards clinked against the concrete a hundred feet below like distant wind chimes. I looked out over the docks as my broken fist wept blood at the gantry cranes unloading a newly arrived ship like predators picking at a carcass. 